I could just start by saying welcome to the Healthy Beast. Today I'm joined by former professional cage fighter turned powerlifter Jack Touchdowski. Okay, I'm gonna have one more card. Jack Touchdowski. There you go. Jack T. Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. But you're known to everyone as Jack T, Polish Jack. Yeah, that works um, for me. Coach T. Coach T, yeah, exactly. And on Instagram, you are jacked underscore T. Yeah, that's it. Jacked T. So jacked for big, I like in case anyone yeah. didn't get it. Yeah. So when I met you five years ago, you were a professional cage fighter. Yes, I retired December 2015. So you probably would have met me just before my last fight, I think. Yeah, I think so. And looking at you now, you somehow managed to make welterweight, which... Yes, I mean, I was a pretty big welter, to be fair. So I would walk around probably 200 pounds, about one, you know, about 90-ish kg, right? And uh, my weight category, uh, welterweight, was 170 pounds. So I would cut 30 pounds to make it. Most of that, actually not, that's a lie. About half of that, I would diet. And then the other half, so about seven or so kilograms was done over the last 24 hours in a hot bath. That was a big cut, pretty aggressive. In hindsight, probably hurt me in at least some of my fights. But, um, you know, it's one of those learning experiences, I guess. But yeah, it was definitely a pretty big welterweight. You'd never make that weight now, right? No way, no. It's, it's no. basically, in, in old money, it's 12 stone, isn't it? 170 pounds, so 12, 12 and a bit stone. Which, See, I don't know stone. Uh, that's, so. Yeah, that's how, growing up, we would just have 14 pounds to a stone. So yeah, 12 stone, 170 pounds is... You know, for, for a guy looking like you look now, you'd never get down that anywhere close to that, no, right? Definitely not. But you know, I mean, I I weighed seventy kg when I was fourteen years old. So you were big from the get go. Kinda not not massive big. I think just, just maybe a little bit thick, I guess. But like not not jacked or anything like this. Not till not till later. But with cutting that much weight, it was a little bit of a necessity for me because I'm short for for the weight class. You know, like I'm um, 180 centimeters, so it's just just under 510, I think, or 510 something like that. So for me, you know, most guys I thought even at welterweight were six foot plus. So obviously they were quite a bit taller than me, uh, quite a bit rangier than me. And for me to start to to actually hang with guys, let's say at middleweight, who you know would have been even taller than that, like I say six three, six four. Uh, that would have been even more difficult. So, so it was kind of a necessity cutting down to welterweight. Definitely not something I'd done. Uh, I had done happily. And was it a big relief when you stopped and didn't have to torture yourself like that anymore? Yes, knowing that I will never have to do a drastic weight cut again was definitely quite quite a relief. But I will have to say the biggest relief for me at the moment when I made a decision i i just don't want to go for another fight camp there was the thought in my head you know like my head that just kind of popped up there you didn't want to do another fight camp yeah and as soon as as soon as that 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 thought you know took shape in my head and i realized i don't want to go for another fight camp like immediately i knew that this is it i'm retiring i'm not gonna half-ass it i'm not gonna be one of those guys that i want to have one last fight or go into a fight knowing that it's your last one I, i i never never understood that so like for me as soon as the thought sort of took shape in my head i knew i would retire but the that thought was immediately followed by another one and it was one of the happiest thoughts in my life ever it was uh i will never do cardio again never Never cardio never never again even if my life depends on it i will not do cardio and it was like honestly that was such a relief it was like i don't know if you ever if you ever had any subjects like this at school but you know when you finish school and let's say you had this one subject or subjects that you hated and you know you will never have to go to the class again ever in your life that's how i feel about cardio so you never enjoyed it when you were fighting? Oh God, no! That was a that was a chore. That was like by far the worst part of training for me. I loved sparring. I loved drilling, practicing technique, getting better. I've always liked strength training, which is obviously why I ended up pursuing that further. Cardio was always the thing I hated. For anyone who thinks that's because you're lazy, because you know, so a lot of people don't, you know, look for excuses to skive off training. That's certainly not you, because. The amount of work you put in, I mean, it's... Yeah, incredible. absolutely. I mean, look, I, I, I know that my work, my work ethic is second to none. It is what it is. But I definitely am not built for cardio in a sense that, you know, like some athletes find some things easier. And obviously, we all tend to fall back on our strengths, right? So, you know, guys that like doing cardio, that improve in that aspect easily, you'll see them doing conditioning, you know, all day, every day, because it's fun for them. They're good at it. And that's also how they win fights. Right, they outwork the opponents. You know, they 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 can drown them uh, with work rate and just you know drag them into deep waters and beat them there. Whereas for me, that was never my strength, and I knew this. I was always very aware of this. So like any kind of amount of work that I was spending on cardio seemed to have helped a bit, 
but I was never a cardio machine, even though I, I didn't really neglect that part of training. I just didn't enjoy it. But, you know, I was very responsive to strength training and I've always liked this. And also that, again, that would reflect in my fights. Like I, you know, I kind of, I was aggressive, come forward, kind of guns blazing. And from, I mean, it's no secret. Like the longer the fight lasted, the, the worst I usually, the worst I usually perform, <laughs> right? I mean, if I could put away someone quickly, awesome. And I could make you look really good. But then, you know, see me in round three and it's a different fighter, you know? Do you think people started to know that about you? That Absolutely, they, you know, yeah. Keep Absolutely. out of his way, yeah. out of the doors. Yeah, I mean, one of my last fights, and, and, and you know, like, I was a really good fight, I think a title fight on PLMMA or something like this. So I felt I had first round, and uh, uh, coming on to the second round, I felt really good, landed some decent shots, uh, and I uh, got a little bit lazy. And got taken down off of a lazy uh, naked low kick that I didn't set up with anything and I got eff effectively TKO'd uh, on the ground elbows and I remember kind of like as I'm walking out you know of the venue and you can hear the guy in the cage giving his post-fight interview and, and I could hear him say like oh I knew that as long as I survived the first round they'll be okay oh, no. so I thought like <laughs> yeah I mean he wasn't wrong to be fair you know like I, I thought I had him round one I hurt him pretty bad and, and, and I had him rocked at one point and I was close I feel to put him in a way towards the round, uh, end of round one but I've always known my strengths and weaknesses. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not a cardio machine. I never will be, and and that's okay. Apart from the cardio, is there other stuff you didn't like about MMA, about cage fighting? Training wise, yeah, or the or, or, or fighting itself. I mean, so training wise, I like training every aspect of uh, mixed martial arts in the sense of you know sort of every martial arts that I chose to train at, right? Because different fighters will make different choices here, you know? Like, my stand-up was mainly boxing. Like, I threw low kicks and knees, but boxing was sort of where I would spend most of my time training stand-up, you know? Let's say my grappling was probably more wrestling than jiu-jitsu, right? I mean, I did both, but I would always fall back more onto one. So, like, because as a fighter, you kind of choose... To a degree, as you build your style and you develop as an athlete, you kind of choose what you want to pursue. It's you more than likely you're gonna like that aspect of training because you kind of all right. I want to do this for stand up, this for grappling, this for ground game, and and that's fine. So the only aspect of training I didn't like was the conditioning slash cardio. Um, I've always liked learning new things, new techniques. Uh, so that was fun for me. Uh, I've always liked sparring. You know, especially I mean, hell, like when I was fighting, man, I had sparring partners like Jake Bostwick that was like. Every, every or ball arm or yellow like these guys every round it was like a fight you know you go out there and it's and every round, and you try and put each other out as well you know and we'll hug it out after and stuff but we would really try to try to kill each other bell to bell and that was fun for me that was entertaining at the time so those aspects i really liked but then there's i feel like you know because because when you say what did it you like about mma there's a ton of aspects to it not necessarily training related it can be extremely difficult to deal with you know especially if you are let's say if you're trying to uh, think of it as making a living you know you have zero guarantee that your guy won't pull out the week before the fight right i mean we've seen it happen to let's say kids like lonnie all the time right yeah you know he's done his whole fight camp did the work made weight and the guy just doesn't turn up because he's injured if he's really injured or not i i don't know that's not for me to say but the point is these things happened a lot you know shows get cancelled fights fall through people get injured so there's a shit ton of uncertainty that goes with it and your whole kind of schedule and life revolves around the fact that you may have a fight or you may not so you've always as you're running up to it you've always got that uns uncertainty yeah. you just have to put it out of your mind and think it's gonna happen i mean look it's relatively easy for you to put out of your mind you're a fighter but you know it can uh, take a bit more of a toll on your wife for example right uh, mm -hmm. so you know stuff like this obviously um is also a factor you know so like in that sense like there's a lot of stuff that's difficult with this i feel and seeing younger kids like younger generation of fighters now kind of go through the same through the same sort of like uncertainty it's a little bit sad for me sometimes to see because they, 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 the level of the game has improved so much i mean the kids that fight amateur right now would you know probably beat most of the pros i don't know 15 years ago or something right like it's just the level has evolved so much they put so much work and they're so talented they're such hard working athletes and what they get in return just doesn't seem enough you know so that that uncertainty i feel like is just unfair the way the way the whole industry i don't want to use the word rigged but the way the whole industry is organized i feel like it's not necessarily the fighters favor i mean if you look at i, I don't remember the exact figure but if you look at percentages let's say what what it costs to put up a boxing show, a high-level boxing show, right? And the percentage of this 
that that will be the percentage of expenses of a show that will be fighters purses there's going to be a significant chunk right because these guys get paid you know so that's going to be one of the biggest expenses going to be paying the fighters especially let's say the top top of the card right I think when UFC released their figures, I want to say it was like a year or two years ago, that was something like 20% of expenses was fighters. So where's all the money going, right? So stuff like this, I feel like that's really bad. Uh, so there's a lot of aspects of the industry that I feel are just extremely, let's say, unfair or, I don't know, unlucky, however you want to call, uh, call this. But I definitely didn't think about it much when I was a fighter. I definitely didn't spend a lot of time thinking on it. I just kept my head down and trained and fought when I got a chance. I suppose people see like a few rich... UFC fighters and they think oh there's tons of money in the sport but really I mean there's so many even within the UFC there's hundreds of people and most of them aren't getting that much money and then you've got all obviously all the other organizations and I think just because a few people have made lots of money doesn't mean yeah I mean you know but it's following the same logic I mean you know not everyone's going to be not every kid that's recording music on his computer is going to be Jay-Z right there's on every person that made it to that level is probably going to be what hundreds thousands of people that didn't right so like, i feel like i mean don't get me wrong i'm not saying this to dishearten people and it's awesome to have you know big goals and and sort of high aspirations and chase after them absolutely and 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 i don't think there's any point of going into any sport thinking oh yeah i'm 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 going to be mediocre right like that's that's just a waste of time so obviously no one does that i get it but i feel like at least to a degree people need to be a bit realistic and understand not not everyone is going to get to that level be great yeah be awesome be as good as you can be but like don't necessarily assume that you'll go all the way out there right well, certainly not an easy way to fame and fortune is it absolutely yeah what there's nothing it? easy about it man were, were you um were you little when you started wrestling is that what you started first no so i think the first thing this is going now, you know, like 30 way back, 30 years, yeah, 30 years back or something like this. So this oh, is you're a, younger this, than me, Jack, you know. This is a long... How, how old were you when you, how old are you now? Thir- I'll be 39 in December. Okay, so you're um, 34 or something when you stopped. Yeah, I think, yeah, 30, actually I retired, I think the day before my 34th birthday or something okay. like this, yeah. And uh, I started martial arts as a kid, some traditional martial arts, I think I was like seven or eight, but it was... You know, that has about as much carry over to a fight as a little dragon's class. I mean, let's face it, this is just basically a little bit of gymnastics and a little bit of coordination. And you, you learn techniques here and there, but let's not pretend that this is actually training for fighting or training martial arts. This is just fun for kids, right? What class was it? Sorry. I can't remember, like actually. I think it was thing. something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, Most people take a karate class when they might even have been something like kung fu, you know, or something like really, you know. Don't uh, knock the kung fu. That's how I start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it might it's have been something. It's a bad like rap that. recently. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not. It used to compete with karate, and then suddenly, I don't know, when um, MMA came along, kung fu got a bad name. I think because of all the bullshit. You well, know? that's the problem, right? You've got all those all those uh, people, you know, that that what's like in the industry called bullshito, right? All those yeah. all those you know those weird guys that think they have special skills and they're surrounded by yes men so they actually end up believing they have those special kids skills or whatever they go into an actual fight and get found out right and then mm-hmm. obviously that reflects bad or whatever martial arts they're trying to represent so yeah i started with something like that then that fizzled out relatively quickly i don't think they lasted a year and then and then i think when i was like i want to say in my teens i started uh that was because i wanted this time like when i was a kid my, my parents just kind of dropped me off to a class and that was that um then as a teen i started with actually karate but it was i don't know how popular this in uk but it's kyokushin so it's a it's a style of karate that's called knockdown they don't call it full contact because you don't punch the face so you punch the body you can kick and knee the face uh, but you can't punch the face but you fight fight bare knuckles right so you don't have any gloves you don't have any padding on your fists or anything like this and you hit the body obviously full power you're looking to stop people with these shots you can grab the head and pull it down to the knee that's absolutely legal but you can't punch the face so it's a slightly weird rule set that lends itself obviously then to a very specific fighting style where people stay really close and just try and beat the shit of each other and kind of just try and put each other away with body shots and kicks right but it's it was fun it was fun i feel like it, it taught me a lot as, as well about like standing my ground in a fight and 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 what it actually meant then i think because i've always felt that it's a little bit removed from a fight because obviously the fact that you're not punching the face like i gradually started kind of looking for stuff that would be more and more i don't know applicable a little bit more like a real fight so you know then uh, i started doing from there i transitioned like a lot of kids i think or, or, or teens do from kyokushin to muay thai and from there because i've 
I've always felt and to be fair my coaches felt as well like my hands were probably my biggest asset like I was I, I started spending a little bit more time doing boxing then around that time I think I first discovered what then wasn't called MMA mind you that was called not holds barred or valetudo right like mm. the name MMA didn't exist yet and I started following you know those those sort of there wasn't even really social media then so it was more like you found it in some articles or somewhere right and or some really old tapes you know and um and i thought it was really fun and and i definitely thought like oh shit i want to do this someday and then i started seeking out places to train and i think this was around the time when in poland you had like first sort of valetudo gyms or clubs and they would effectively uh train no gi bjj no one did gi mind you no one gave a shit about gi then uh like a lot of people yeah. still don't but well because it know, doesn't but... carry over right okay. i mean that's my opinion you know like and I'll, I'll stand by it like everyone i know that says oh bro i started doing gi and my jujitsu is so much better well yeah you were doing jujitsu three times a week now you do it seven times a week of course it's better wearing pjs has fuck all to do with it right like it's just you know but i had um mauricio roger's dad sat there the other day so i have to be Oh, I get it. No, I no, no. Be, you, I have to be careful what I say. You know? Oh, of course. I, no, you I, can't. I respect yeah. for See, the I, I, I am not going to get graded ever again, mm -hmm. so I can speak my mind. Uh, <laughs> I have seen you in a gi once, I think. I wore it. Oh, no, I, wore I, heard you'd, I heard you'd worn one. I think yeah, so, I so you know, like, I think after I retired, Tommy made me put a gi on once. I think it may have even been his gi because I don't think I had my own. And so he you squeezed yourself in. That's it, yeah. And he and he gear. gave me his own his own blue belt, which was a big deal for me because I think for Tommy that was the first person he graded. I was the first person he actually graded, not you know not Hodge and someone else, but he graded it, right. Like he gave me his, he gave me the blue belt, and for me it was a big deal because obviously like Tommy and me go way back. I mean we started training together. This is Polish Tommy, who also with an unpronounceable surname from yes. <laughs> Elevate, yes. head jiu-jitsu instructor Elevate in Richmond. Event. Exactly. Very yeah. and, uh, and, you know, like for me, for me, that was uh, that, that, that had a really kind of large sentimental value. And this is... Don't so it wrong. meant something to you, sorry to interrupt, it meant something to you to get your blue belt, did it? Yeah, I mean, because it was from Tommy. Okay. Not because so you, you were old friends from yeah. back in Poland. That was like a, for me that was that was a very big deal. It was also like the end of an era, if you will, because I had already retired at the time. Tommy has cornered me for a few of my fights, nearly got a heart attack every time he did that. He said he was I think he was the happiest person in the world when I retired. Um, I remember him saying it to me a long time ago. We were talking about you for some reason. I can't remember what you'd done, but we were, you were being discussed and he said he said about I think we were talking about the powerlifting now and he said it's hard. That's why I was asking you, I guess, whether you found it hard going into the cage. Because he said watching, probably even harder watching, because if you're the fighter, I guess you're you're into it, you're, you're, you're deep into it. But if, if you're watching your friend going into a cage, it's got to be hard. And he told me it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. So I can tell you, because having had the experience from both ends, right? I mean, I've coached fighters, right? Uh, I've, uh, I've, I've, you know, I've cornered Lonnie, I've cornered Charlotte, like I've, I've, I've coached fighters and, and I build them up and, and I know exactly what it means. And... It's a lot tougher watching someone go into the cage than walking into the cage. Because when you go into the cage, first and foremost, like, you want this. Don't get me wrong, there will be moments and people lie about this and say they never felt it or they never feel like this, but it's bullshit. There will be moments when you walk into the cage and you think, why the fuck am I doing this? Like, what am I doing this for? Everyone has that moment at some point or another. Everyone has that. I don't believe they don't. They lie if they say they don't. Everyone has those doubts every now and then and that's cool. But, but you still know deep down like that I get to do this. I don't have to do this, right? This is something I chose to do and I want to do it. I want to be here. I want to showcase my skill. And that gives you at least some sort of sense semblance of control and you do have a, obviously i would say about 50 percent of control over the outcome of the fight right i mean the other guy is the other 50 percent, but you have a decent amount of control over what happens but when you're outside a cage in the corner you feel like you have no control you know and 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 oftentimes the person in the cage is someone you have very strong feelings for, right? I mean, it could be your best friend. It could be someone you've coached for so long that they feel like a family member, right? Like, a, I don't know, a younger brother or like your child. I mean, like, the, you build strong bonds, right? When you spend that much time together and you coach people and you kind of sweat and bleed together, right? Like, so for me, being on that end, being in a, in a corner man's seat was a lot more stressful and a lot more uncomfortable than than fighting itself like i've always enjoyed fighting and as soon as i stopped enjoying it i retired with coaching that was always a bit of a mixed bag for me 
Because I'm thinking of, uh, particularly of, of Lonnie, Lonnie Kavanagh, who, you know, he's an up-and-coming pro and he's, you know, he could, could go all the way, great fighter. I think probably people have mistaken him for your son before. You know, you spent a lot of time together, you're obviously very close. Oh, he must be, what's he, how old is he now? Nearly 20, is he? But he doesn't... 21? Uh, 21 now, but he could be could pass for 15, I would have thought, pretty easily. And it's not until you see him fight that you realise he's anything other than just a sweet little kid. So, I mean, it must be hard for you. It is. It is, and you got to remember as well, like I've trained Lonnie, uh, or I had trained Lonnie since he was 13, right? So like, when I met him, he was literally like, so imagine, like he, he looks 12 now, yeah. right? And so imagine what he looked like when he was actually, he was actually 13, 20. Like, <laughs> he, he looked about eight, and he was this quiet little kid, like always super polite, and, and just maybe a little bit timid until you put a pair of gloves on him, and then he would, he would spar grown men. You know, like I, I remember having him spar, I think before his first MMA fight, which he had at 14 years old. So we shark tanked him, right? So that man, he had fresh opponent for every round. But I told him that we would spar the same way we uh, sparred in Team Titan at the time. So when you're being shark tanked, let's say you have five rounds with five different opponents. But if you finish your opponent before the round ends, you get to rest the remainder of the round. Right, so this is a this is a way to motivate you to not just sur- survive the rounds because you can kind of go into survival mode in doing shark tanks. This is my problem with shark sh- the idea of shark tank. It can put you in a mindset of I'm just gonna get through this rather than I'm here out here to win. And uh, and I told Lonnie that I was like, look, you stop them, you get to rest the remainder of the round. And he knocked all four of them out. Four grown men. One of them when is spinning like with a wheel kick to the head. Who was the head coach of the academy? We both worked at, at the time, so that was quite funny. But um, yeah. I first saw him, I'd seen him a couple of times and I saw him hitting a heavy bag and I just thought, oh, Jesus. Like the noises he was making, just a vicious yeah. focus. Yeah, man. Yeah, I think the last fight I ever cornered was his. I can't remember. It was either Charles Bellator fight or his um, his one. I remember, um, was it round one? He was a little bit tentative throwing right hands. I'm, when I go into the cage between the rounds, I'm like, you okay? He says, oh, just so you know, I broke my right hand. I said, all right. Can you take him down for me and elbow him and TKO him then so he can go home, please? Alonso says, yes, sir. And that's literally all he did. Round two, double leg, few elbows, put him out, that's it. Home. Like, this is like the sort of... And he was, I don't know, we'll say 19 or 20 at the time, right? Like, this is, you know, we're talking like the, the level of sort of maturity from, from, from him is absolutely insane in that. And again, work ethics. Like, I've never seen anyone work that hard. You said you stopped enjoying it. So you, was there like a clear point at which you said, like, I don't like this anymore? Not a clear point, um, definitely not a clear point. Like it wasn't as clear cut as with, with, let's say, my own career, right? It was literally like as soon as the thought creeped in my head, you know, I don't want to do another fight camp, straight away, I'm not fighting ever again. That's it. I'm not going to half-ass a fight camp and go in there. So it was very different with coaching because when I first retired from fighting, I imagined I would still be involved in a sport in a coaching capacity, right? And I was for quite a while. And I even thought, well, maybe I'll still compete a little bit. Like, I'll compete in BJJ or something. You know? Like, I did two BJJ comps. Didn't really didn't really have a lot of fun. Oh, I've seen a, I've seen a clip of you double-legging someone in. Yeah, so I that placed... Was, that was, I've seen that a few times. I didn't even know you were supposed to slam for that I mean, in. because it was done with momentum, it was legal. It was comp legal because I didn't pick him up and drop him. Oh, so you can't I pick shot up in with, spike, moment, with momentum, yeah. Movement, you can do it. Uh, okay. But yeah, I mean, you know, he couldn't wrestle for shit. His jiu-jitsu was better than mine, but he couldn't, like, the, 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 the takedown and the fight, like, he couldn't carry on. So, I think I ended up placing second there. It was 20, I think, 15 uh, BJJ Nationals, no gi, and it was the, the, the brown and black belt division, the expert division. And obviously then, after I retired, and Tommy awarded me my blue belt uh, as a retirement <laughs> gift. Uh, the one time I put gi on, he gave me his blue belt. He, after that, when I entered the comp 2016, and I wanted to enter the same division, they said, well, you can't, you're a blue belt now. I was like, that makes zero sense oh, so you got to go down a division. yeah yeah so i won it like quite comfortably but i didn't really enjoy it like kind of kind of didn't enjoy any of it to be honest with you like i was i was like sitting there having my weight having sorry having my name uh read out waiting to have my name uh, read out i was like i just feel flat really yeah and 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 the buzz that you'd normally get from winning i i was like meh Really didn't get much of one. No, so so at that point I knew that yeah, this is it. I'm definitely not going to compete in any combat sports ever again. And I had already, I think I had already competed at powerlifting at the time once, uh, and I knew that like this is it. That, that's what I'm going to pursue. This is a lot more fun for me now. But obviously I still coached, and my coaching sort of enthusiasm in, in MMA fizzled out a lot more gradually. And that was I feel 
and <laughs> shit, how do I say this? So that was actually, I feel like that was a multifaceted decision, so to speak. Um, so that was like, a, 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 there was definitely layers to it, you know, or what made me not want to do this again. But I think that the one that was the, the deciding factor for me, and this is probably going to sound weird, and I don't think I've ever, like, spoken out loud about this like this. I've definitely spoken to closest friends about this, but not, not like, not that way or this way. Was I, I started getting really uncomfortable teaching violence at some point. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I can't say what it is. I stopped watching fights as well. Really? Yeah. I, I did not know this yeah. about you. I, yeah, right. Well, I knew you'd retire, but I didn't. So you've kind of gone off the, yeah. the sport. Don't let me wrong. Like, I, I um, this isn't to say that I think it's bad or I don't know anything like this. I'm not going to criticize it. Uh, it. it it was a massive part of my life and it, I am where I am because I did what I did, right? So this is definitely not a criticism, but it was just, I think, on, on my end, like an internal kind of change at some point that I just, I just, yeah, I just stopped being comfortable with it, you know? And uh, and also the, the, the fighting style that I always had and how I would teach and I would, I would always, it was always focused on, well, efficiency really, but efficiency meant, causing the most amount of damage possible right mm. and and when i started looking at it like that i think gradually the older i was getting the the, the more uncomfortable with mm. the idea i was so that again that wasn't an, a sudden thing it's no that re- definitely happened over time that was definitely a gradual process and i can't tell you when i had the realization that i just don't actually feel that comfortable doing this anymore but um but yeah so then did you go and have a conversation with people you were training with Lonnie and Well, actually, and say, this was already at a time, I think, where I hadn't really at the time been training Lonnie and Charlotte. They've already moved on to GB Top Team. So they are handled by Brad Pickett, who's an amazing coach and amazing fighter. And I think he manages their careers as well. Obviously, Brad's also a close friend of mine, and I, I really don't think they could have done much better in terms of progressing their careers to end up with someone like Brad coaching them. But I think, yeah, that kind of meant that I was away from a sport for a little while, and I hadn't really been coaching uh, fighters for a while. And kind of dipping the toe back in was, I think, I think Charlotte's Bellator fight. I think that was actually my last one, now that I think about it. So you've closed the door completely on coaching MMA now? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like this is just, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, I'm not going to lie, there are moments when I can't help myself a little bit, right, in a sense, you know, like, let's say I walk through the gym, and I see people drilling something, right, and they're drilling something that, let's say something that's a little bit maybe close to my heart, because I didn't have the widest repertoire of techniques, but the ones I did, I did well. So let's say if they do something that, that I really liked, or that I won fights with, you know, and they was like, oh, guys, you're butchering it, like, I can't, can't look at it, right, and then I'll get on the mat, and I'll help them, and that would normally, I would never do this to anyone I don't know, I'm never gonna give unsolicited advice, like, just butt into someone's class, and, you know, take over, but let's say if it's a class, and well, you'll know which people I'm talking about. Obviously, I, I get that people who don't know the gym wouldn't. But let's say if it's Mike drilling with someone, right? I mean, Mike and me have been friends forever, right? Very big bodybuilder fella. Exactly. So, like, for me, when I see Mike doing a technique and I think he could do it better, I'm going to walk up and I'm going to help him do it better. And he knows that this is not unsolicited advice. This is one friend helping another. Because if the roles were reversed, he would have done the same thing for me, right? So, in that sense, I sometimes can't help myself. Or, like, I'll just give him, like, a little kind of tweak here and there. But I probably wouldn't you know want to teach him and make classes again if it makes sense so would you watch if, if it's friends of yours fighting coming up will you watch their fights at all or would you so just would you sort of don't probably don't depends do on context that? because because it's not a it's not a case where like i'm um, you know like i'm not i'm not upset or angry with mma it's not that like i don't want to watch it because it's hurting my feelings or anything like this but it's just more like i i'm just a little bit uncomfortable and i feel like if that was so let's say hypothetically, let's say Mike has a fight and he asked me to help him. I'll help him because because we're friends. And if I believe that my presence there would add to his performance rather than detract from it, I'll definitely help him. Um, but on the same token, like I wouldn't want to take on a fighter to coach them for a career again and stuff like this. Just I wouldn't want to do this. I feel like this is this is such an emotionally difficult thing to do when you care. Because if you don't give a shit, it's easy. Right? Like you just let people out there, just send them in a cage and whatever happens, happens. But if you care about them, and I tend to bond with people, then I find it very hard to not be maybe sometimes like, I don't know, overprotective. Mm-hmm. And then it makes me, I worry like it also can make me lose objectivity. Right? Because 
you know, as they coach, like you have to give them fights that are challenging so they keep progressing. And I, I've, I've always done that. I have to say, admit this. I've always done that. I've never handpicked fights for myself. I never handpicked fight, fights for my fighters. Um, so like, I've I've always wanted them to get challenged and go f- push forward and stuff. But, but on the same token, like you want them to win everything, mm. right? And and obviously that may not happen. And likelihood is it won't happen. I don't know. It's just tricky, man. Like it's it's really hard. And and it wasn't always for me, definitely. But at some point, it stopped started being hard. I think I think maybe watching a few guys get badly hurt changed it for me as well. Would you go say sorry to interrupt? Would you say it goes as far as putting a kind of moral question mark over the sport for you? Not to the point where I would question the sport because I feel it would be hypocritical of me because I I you know where the gym is where I'm at like all that stuff happened because I fought for so long and stuff like this like I mean I mean I was in a position to to coach in this gym and then to build up um, the team and everything else like I I a lot of things happened a lot of the good things happened to me because I had a fighting career right so it would be hypocritical of me to have like a moral issue with the sport but. It's just like there's nothing wrong with the sport. It's just something has changed on my end where I don't necessarily feel comfortable watching it. And and there's other sports out there, you know, like this. And I'm not going to criticize the sport. I don't think this that there's. I don't think the sport is. I don't know, unsafe or barbaric or anything like this. Everyone involved in the sport is a consulting consenting adult. They all know what they're doing and stuff, and it's fine. But at some point, for me, it started being more stress than entertainment. Watching the fights, and rather than enjoying the skill level, I'm thinking like, how are they going to pay their bills? And at that point, it just stopped being fun for me, you know? And I feel like one of the first moments for me like this was when, I think one of the Bellator fights in in London when Cyborg fought Michael Page and Page caved his skull in with a flying knee. And and I think that was one of those moments. And I was already retired at the time. If I hadn't been retired, I would have moved past it. And I know this. Now, in hindsight, looking back at it, like I know that if I still had been a fighter, I probably would have immediately pushed the thought out of my head. And I'd be like, well, it is what it is. You know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword kind of thing, right? Because you have to really... Yeah, you can't worry about shit like this because then it's going to affect your decision-making and and it's going to make you tentative, right? So... But because you were you were already retired, you probably you were more receptive to it. Yeah, and in a different place, right? And 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 you know, and and then it made me think like, well, shit, like he's got a wife and kids. He's not exactly going to go to an office, uh, right? Like he's not going to get an office job, uh, a guy like Cyborg. So what's he going to do now? Like if he can't fight, let's say he's got a. I actually don't know if he's fought after or not, but you know, let's say it was a career-ending injury, right? And then and then you start thinking about stuff like you know all the other guys that let's say get career-ending injuries and they're like in their twenties. Hmm. like yeah cool that's a lot of time to reinvent yourself and no one is an mma fighter forever right that's that's obvious it's a limited shelf life like everyone knows this but i don't know it just made me think more about that aspect of uh, people kind of getting hurt and like do i want to have a hand in this in any capacity Hmm. i don't think you said you used the word hypocritical i don't think it would be hypocritical of you to you know to change your mind on something because you know you've, you've you've done one thing and then you can you can change your mind but i think Lots of people have this conflict. I know I know. I have this conflict in how I look at it because I'm a fan of the sport and I watch it a lot. But when it comes to, say, my kids, I mean, my, my boy's doing jiu-jitsu and kickboxing now and, you know, there's a there's a possibility that he might want to do MMA. And I'm thinking, oh, is, is, is it hypocritical of me to enjoy watching this sport but hope my son doesn't want to do it? You know, that's... that's I see what I mean, yeah. You see, when it comes down, it's people close to you thinking, oh, I want to I want to pay to watch these... These other these strangers beat the shit out of each other and and you know be be whooping when they get knocked out cold, which I, I have you know I sometimes have these misgivings when I'm watching it. You know it's the kind of whooping at the victory and you're thinking the guy's not in a good way. Yeah, you know so so yeah to to enjoy something as entertainment but not want your family to do it is I I feel hypocritical for feeling like that. So. I don't think it would at all be because of you. I yeah, said that, I, to, I see to, your to point. change Definitely. your mind on something. Definitely. I mean, I think this is the case. I feel like the closest I can get to describing it would be, I feel like you know this. I, I absolutely do not think there's anything wrong with the sport, and you know, like I I loved it for a very very long time, and it was one of the most important things in my life for a very long time, and and then it wasn't. You know, and then it's changed. Then I don't have any negative feelings toward it. I just don't enjoy it anymore. You know. So were you already powerlifting for fun when you were fighting? Was that something? No, that no, just... no. So I had been strength training as a fighter because most athletes in most sports should strength train. I would go as far as to say that they all should strength train to a degree. Uh, whether it's to make them less injury prone or enhance performance, you know. 
So for that reason, I was always strength training as a fighter. And I've always enjoyed that part of training massively. Uh, probably proportionally to how much I hated cardio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, so that was always fun for me. And when I retired, I knew I was, I, I knew I wanted to compete because I've, I've always wanted to. It's just, you know, it's part of my nature. I enjoy competing. This is fun for me. And at first I thought I'd compete in BJJ comps, like I told you, but it just wasn't that. And I felt like I actually don't want to do anything with combat sports anymore, competition-wise. I was still coaching, mind you, at the time. So there was no, that was definitely not at a point where I realized I just want to kind of move away from violence in general. It was more just uh, for myself competing. So I thought, well, I'm kind of strong. I like lifting weights. Why not try this? And that's, that's literally how it happened. And uh, and uh, I, thought, uh, I thought I was strong. And... <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I was strong for an MMA fighter. You know, the the weights I was moving as an MMA fighter for 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 an MMA fighter, most MMA fighters at the time would probably be impressive. But then I went to my first ever powerlifting comp, um, and uh, a, a, a female powerlifter and now one of my closest friends, uh, Neha, who competed many weight classes above me, uh, sorry, below me, obviously, as a and, and a lot lighter than me, obviously, and also a female she has squatted i think five kg more in that comp and i was like oh there's levels to this uh strength thing you know because there's there's strong and there's powerlifting strong but what had me sold at, at powerlifting was the fact that in a comp there was not an ounce of negativity because no one cheers against someone, right? Because like in a fight, if you're fighting someone and I cheer for you, by default, I cheer against the other guy. I want the other guy to lose if I want you to win, right? There is no other way. Whereas with this, it's different because people cheer for other people to hit PBs, you know, hit the numbers that they want to hit to the comp. And, and uh, don't get me wrong, people obviously still want to win and place first and stuff first, but it's just a very different vibe. And, you know, you cheer people on, like you cheer on your opposition, you know? I mean, I had guys... This was my first comp. I was completely lost. I didn't know what I was doing. I had people from, like, I had my direct competition helping me warm up really? before the comp. Like, where have you seen something like this? This is not a thing in other sports. I had them help. They helped me put weights on the bar because I was all over the place. They helped me choose my warm ups and stuff. Like, they helped me with everything. Guys that I was competing against, right? Like, I've never seen anything like this. Then there was. Uh, you know, the, the people lifting weights, like it almost didn't matter what was on the bar because you see them fighting for what's their one rep max, their own PB, They for them is the heaviest weight they ever lifted. And the whole building is just up and down, jumping, clapping, cheering them on. It doesn't matter if it's like a, you know, 44 kg teen lifter or if it's like a super heavyweight monster squatting half a ton like it literally didn't matter everyone got the same level of support and respect and because you, you'll everyone around will know that that lift is big for that person exactly right? that and that's all that mattered it's big for you you know it's important to you you know and 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 because of that it's important to others and it was so cool and the the overwhelming supportive vibe i have never seen anything like this at a sporting event and i mind you my only experience is from combat sports right i've never competed in anything else i just fought mma and competed well i've, I've boxed i've tie boxed i competed at bjj and i fought mma but i have never done all, anything all else fighting, exactly yeah. all fighting so so to have that kind of an, exp an experience where you, you know everyone's cheering you on people don't know you and they want you to make the lift like i've never seen anything like this you know and it was just so cool and i was sold from that moment on and and i say this to everyone like everyone that that i train at lifting everyone that i train for strength training i'm i say i honestly i think everyone who trains to get stronger just should try this one time for fun and it may be that the only time they do it because they decide oh you know yeah it was fun but yeah i, I don't actually want to commit enough to you know prepare for a comp or something right which is fine but just to experience like the overwhelming positivity at these events and like how how cool the community is, you know, and and um, and yeah, I was completely blown away. I was sold from that from that first comp. Because did part of you is that you'd been a professional athlete when you turned up at this competition and you see a, a girl who's much lighter than you lifting more than you. Did part of the kind of like the, the ego come back in? And so think, this is interesting. No, I thought I looked at it very differently, right? Because. Maybe it's also because I'd already been retired as a fighter, so I've, I've, the, the the relationship with your ego changes a lot when that happens. You know, like the you drop the bravado, you drop the I ain't never scared bullshit, and uh, yeah. and you just kind of you can be yourself a little bit more, right? And um, so I never felt like that. It was never there was never anything intimidating about it. I found it inspiring because for me it was like shit. She's she's 
like 20 or 30 kilo lighter than me, obviously stronger than me because she's moving bigger weight. So now, where do I go from there? Like, how do I get better? How do I get, do I get that good? All right? And then I'll, I'll talk to people and I'll try and learn from them and not just from coaches, but then lifters and stuff. And, you know, guys, girls, it doesn't matter, right? And, uh, and yeah, I just found it, I've, I've always found it inspiring. Ne I never found it intimidating. I found it motivating, inspiring. Seeing people do amazing things like this, uh, it just kind of, the way I look at it, it just shows what's possible, you know? And I get, don't get me wrong, a lot of these people I'm looking at are outliers, they, they're genetic freaks, and not everyone can get there. I, I'm fully aware of this. Uh, so this is not to sort of, um, in any way, undermine the achievements and say, oh, yeah, this is easy, anyone can do it. This is not where I'm going with this. But the point is they show what's attainable and they give you that something to aim for. And even if you don't quite get there, like it's pretty cool chasing it, you know? And yeah, for me, that was, um, that was an amazing experience. It really was. How much stronger are you now than when you started? Can you put a number? I guess you've got your... So I'm going to use competition lifts to put it in context, right? So my first comp, I think... I squatted something like 180 kg, benched, I think, like 140, and probably deadlift like 230. Uh, my last comp, I squatted 280 kg, I benched 172 and a half, and I deadlifted 272 and a half. So what we, what we use to... This, this score from a comp is total, right? And yeah. total is your heaviest squat, heaviest bench, heaviest deadlift from the day combined. So my last total was 725. My first ever total was, I think, 555. So um, half as strong again, you could... You yeah, could and, much and you know, and obviously context, right? I mean, this, this took years. And there's a lot of people out there that progress a lot faster. A lot of people out there that would have added the same amount on day total in less time and stuff like this. But I feel like uh, one of my bigger learning experience with this was, uh, experiences with this was uh, understanding that you, you can't really compare it. Everyone moves at a different rate. Everyone progresses at a different rate. And you just need to keep building and just looking at how far you've come rather than whatever pace other people are moving at because you're not them. You don't have the same genetic material. You don't have the same training conditions. Maybe you don't have the same, you know, recovery or whatever. So it's kind of pointless comparing yourself on that level and you just chip away, progress and build. And then, you know, the, the time when it really comes to comparing for everyone who wants to compete is obviously a, a competition, right? Because then we compete within a weight class against each other and uh, whoever totals more wins. It's fairly simple, really. So what weight class are you in now? You can hundred kg. Hundred kg. Okay. And I'm 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 kind of growing into this because I I walk around the hundred. I'm just maybe a little bit over now. But all my comps before last one were in a ninety kg class. And progressively, as I was getting heavier and heavier, progressively, I was getting to the point where I was needed to um, start cutting weight. Look, don't get me wrong. I have cut weight in a, in a sense that like I've done water loading and I've, which means like I've manipulated, uh, you know, my water levels and by manipulating sodium and glycogen levels. And, but I didn't cut in a sense I did a diet and for the last couple of comps, I didn't even need a bath or anything like this. So, so there was no cut, no cutting in that sense. But also I don't want to cut like this really for two reasons. One, because I feel like I'm definitely stronger without that cut. So if it means competing at a weight class above, but hitting higher numbers, I'm doing that. And also, like, one of the reasons that, you know, like, I, I power lift because I love it, and I do this for fun, and it's a lot of fun for me. And I feel like if I start doing things like drastic weight cuts, it's not going to be fun, or at least it's going to be less fun. And also, you know, there's, there's this whole thing where, like, why are you really doing this for? Like, if you're taking a, some massive world record, and, and it's important, obviously, then to you, then by all means, go ahead and cut it. But I feel like I just don't want to really cut weight for, like, regional comps, and I just kind of compete at whatever way and just have fun with it one of the things that a lot of people don't realize I, I didn't realize this until you started doing this at the gym with your bar fight team bar underscore fight on insta uh, right? no no but bar fight underscore team bar on, fight underscore team, team yeah. On insta, yeah, yeah that's right is that they don't all look like you right then need these aren't these aren't all you meet heads you don't mind me calling you that oh no no, no i'm meet head, meet head that, and proud yeah with proud with pride it's a kind of it's a you know it's a mixed group of different shapes and sizes and people very oh god I feel like professions and everything yeah I feel like we are somewhat unique as a powerlifting team in a few ways so first this is as far as I know this is the only team that's mainly female lifters 
All right, so we have, I wanna say we've had probably something like 32 people compete at a bar fight. Some just once, some, some compete regularly, uh, some haven't competed yet, but are getting ready to. But it's gonna be something around like 32 people. Some have moved on and compete elsewhere and stuff like this, but it's probably something like we've had about 32 people compete. I want to say, 25 or 27 of that were female competitors really that right so it's just a handful of, of of male lifters on the team and and the vast majority of our team are females out of those females you know you've got emily i think was 16 when she first competed hiromi was 61 when she first competed right you've got people of all sort of ages shapes sizes experience levels and i feel like what you said is a very important uh thing which which i don't think a lot of people realize because I didn't before I started competing, right? That because you have all those categories in powerlifting, it is a sport for everyone. You know, like you have weight divisions, you have age categories. So if you've discovered powerlifting, let's say at 61, you compete in a age group for 60 to 64 year olds, right? Then in, you don't need to compete with 23 year old you know, powerlifter. You can if you want to. You can enter yourself to that class as well. But you have your own category that you can compete in. Obviously, weight classes means that there are people from, I think the lightest females will be like 44 kg. And we actually have, I think, two lifters in that class. And then, you know, you've got obviously super heavyweights for both boys and girls, right? So so literally all shapes and sizes and experience levels. And, and, and I feel like that sort of level of variety and, and diversity makes it really cool. Do people need something? Do they need a certain level of aggression to be able to... Absolutely not, no. Because um... it's still an aggressive sport. I mean, it might. You, in order to be good at it, presumably you need that. I'm, I'm trying to think of... I'm not saying people are scared of you around the gym, but you do no, have, you have that you have that certain attitude that I guess you, you know, made you a good fighter and you could you probably need, when you're pushing out a lift, you need that fire, right? Do you? I, I don't know, man. I think, I mean... I think all my lifters definitely have that fire in them. It's just it can manifest itself in different forms, right? I mean, different people get hyped differently and 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 sort of sort of switch on differently, right? I agree with you that there is a level of aggression needed when when you lifting a one rep max, and um, it may be different for different people. It may mean different things for different people, or like for myself, it even means different things for different lifts. I get hyped differently for squat, differently for bench, differently for deadlift because I need different levels of composure for them, if it makes sense. And that works for me specifically. But a lot of that stuff that may be with me because I am, you know, like an open book. Like you, you, you get what you see and I'm very easy to read and I don't exactly hide anything in terms of my emotions or opinions. And so I feel like maybe my... How I feel on the inside is just a little bit more apparent also on the outside. But for a lot of people, that won't be the case. But but they definitely do have that fire in them. And I feel like anyone can get hyped or aggressive for, you know, for their lift. And where they go, what place they go to, that's a very individual thing. So do you need to find that in people? Do you need to tap into the aggressive? Because I guess everyone's got that side of them um, that they need for emergencies. But So that's a good question. I feel like I feel like this is something that everyone needs to find in them. Because it took me probably five years of competitive lifting to realize how I want to lift in a sense of emotional approach to this, right? So like as a fighter, yes, I was very aggressive, come forward, but also I was also very clinical in it. Like I wasn't doing anything reckless. I wasn't throwing crazy shit out there. I wasn't going for high risk moves in fights. Like I was very composed, right? And, um, and in my head, I thought, well, if this is how I fight, that's probably how I'm going to lift. And I did that for quite a few years. I didn't realize something was missing until I kind of tried something different, right? And and two competitions ago, European Championships in Limerick in summer, was the first time when I've competed when I let myself be really emotional on the platform in every sense of the world. So like walking up to the platform to perform a lift, I would get hyped and I would shout. Whereas before, like I would never do this because like I would, walking up to the platform, I would think like, I kind of don't want to draw attention to myself almost, if it makes sense. Um, or I'm just here to lift. I'm not here for anything else. I'm not going to hear, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm not here to entertain sort of thing. I'm just here to lift. And don't, don't get me wrong. Like I'm still not here to entertain. I'm here to perform my lift, but I'm here to have fun first and foremost. And for me getting hyped, getting really emotional for lift, it makes it so much more fun for me. But it took me years to realize it, right? And I do need to get a little bit aggressive for squat. Otherwise, I can get a little bit intimidated by the weight. So I need to be like really switched on aggressive. Kind of, I got this kind of thing. Then for for bench, I stay very composed because I find bench very, very technical and very complex. And uh, and there's a lot of things I have to do right for me 
to to pull it off. So like I stayed really cool headed for this. But then for deadlift, I'm like hyper aggressive and and just have a lot of fun with it. And it took me a while to figure it out. And I feel like this isn't something that I can find in people as a coach necessarily. I think this is something they need to figure out how they want to do it. You know, a lot of times when people first start something, they get really self-conscious, right? Because I I was as well. Like going out to the platform and yelling, like you, you, you may feel a little bit silly, you know? No one will think that, mind you, in a calm. They don't they don't give two shits. Like if you wanna if you wanna shout, fucking shout. No one cares. And lots of people Exactly. Shout, yeah. I mean I've seen know. people headbutt a bar before they, you know, they squat, right? And like split their head open on it. You know, like I mean people do different things and, and some people may like chuckle at it a little bit or whatever, but no one will really judge you for it because they don't care, right? Like ultimately you dare to perform the lift, have fun, hit your PB and whatever, and they dare to cheer you on. And I feel like figuring out what works for you, because some people will feel, let's say, super self-conscious doing this. And if they feel like, oh my God, I'm faking it, that's going to probably get in their heads too much and mess with them. But then some people, as soon as they let go of this and, and just really let their emotion go, they just they just have a lot of fun, you know? And I feel like everyone needs to find how they how they want to approach this. I'm always happy to help. And, and I'm, I always try and guide my guys in the sense that I always share stuff like this with them as well, just like I told you, right? Well, it took me five years to figure it out. Now I know how to do it. This is how I found out. So you just need to try different things and something will stick. But I won't kind of push them in any direction for this. It's just a matter of like trying to show them that there's different ways of doing it, I guess. You um, do you plan to carry on? Because obviously you can compete at any age. You plan to carry on indefinitely, and yes. So my this is something that I get reminded sometimes by my training partners as well. Where uh, if I, because as much as I say, uh, oh, you know, you don't want to compare yourself to others. Like we're all guilty of that sometimes, right? So every now and then I'll be like, oh, you know, like why can't I move at this rate? Why can't I progress at this rate or whatever? And then then I need to remember, and I get reminded of it frequently. Then I need to remember that what's your goal here? Because like for a lot of people going into powerlifting, the goal will be, I want to hit this number or this total. And and once they do, they may want to move on to something else. Some other challenges in their life will completely different uh, or just retire. Some won't. Some will hit the number and their appetite will grow and they'll want more bigger numbers. But a lot of people, a lot of people just won't have a specific goal. And what if if that's the case, then okay, this is different. Because I imagine then if you look at it in in that sense then the, 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 there may also be some sort of a time frame on this goal whereas for me the goal with this is to lift for as long as possible that's the primary goal for me with powerlifting uh, I have particular goals numbers that I want to hit but I also know that once I hit them I'll want to hit higher numbers it's just you know it's, it's been up like this for five years for me right so like I know that this is going to probably not change um I also know that there's going to come a point where adding weight is going to become more difficult on the bar. And I mean, it already kind of is, but, you know, like even more so, or, you know, you may be at some point not even possible. And and some people reach that point uh, uh, in their careers as well. And um, and when that happens, that happens. But the, the, the main thing for me is to lift for as long as possible, as physically possible. It It's, it's, you know, it's my happy place. It's uh, it's definitely made me a better human being, and uh, and, and I just want to keep it up for as long as possible. I just got to ask you one dumbass question before we go, Jack. Right now, it's particularly dumbass in context of you saying you don't like hurting people anymore. But if bigger, stronger Jack from now is locked in a room with five years ago, smaller but professional fighting Jack, who comes out? Depend on how long the fight goes. You know, like if the I mean, your cardio wasn't good then, it's yeah, not, it's yeah, not yeah. Really better, is it? Definitely not better now. So if the if the if the younger Jack can make it last, he wins. Uh, but if the bigger, heavier Jack has his way early, then 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 he wins for sure. Perfect. I can see you can st- you can still think your way into it just about. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it ever really goes away. No. Amazing. Well, we're out of time, unfortunately. Thanks Great so much, Rich. You. Jacked underscore T. On Instagram. That's it. Jack T, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rich. Cheers. Thanks very much again to Jack T. Find out more about his ever-increasing strength on Instagram at Jack underscore T. His team, bar fight team, is bar fight underscore team. Healthy Beast is at Healthy Beast Podcast. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.